sea, worship His majesty, unto Jesus be the glory, honor, and praise, majesty, kingdom, authority.
Weren't those kids wonderful to listen to? Amen. You know, as, as they were waving their little palm branches, I know you guys were wanting to stand up and do this. And work. Maybe next year we'll do that. That'll be, we'll, maybe we'll each bring a palm branch and we'll all do it together. Wouldn't that be fun? Before we get started, I'd like to um, remind us of our prayer team that meets as we gather in our worship service in the back if you're in need of prayer. Um, I know holiday seasons uh, can be difficult times for many people, so um, if it's a time that you need some prayer, there's uh, people that love to pray with you and intercede for you in the very presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And during the week, too, we have prayer teams that meet. And if you have a prayer request and you would like us to pray for you, please put that on this prayer card in the pew rack in front of you and put it in the offering plate as it comes around later on in the worship service. Also, if you are a visitor or new mem or new person that's just coming and um, visiting us here at the church, we'd love to know who you are so that we might just thank the Lord of your presence with us and um, get to know you a little bit better as well. Or if there's things that are going on in your life that you need for us to know that are changing, maybe you're moving or changing your email address or something like that, that's a good way to communicate that with us as well. Today is Palm Sunday, and uh, we've already celebrated the goodness of our God. And one, one little um, thing that I'd like to mention, too, that as Jesus is coming into the city of Jerusalem riding on a, on a pony, uh, we recognize the humility that he puts himself through. Most kings would drive, come in on a stallion, pomp and circumstance. And isn't that kind of what we look forward to today? We, were, we look for the real elaborate pomp and circumstance in people. We think people with power have pomp and circumstance. We think people that have authority will use that authority to have people draw attention to them in such a way that we elevate them to a, a higher level. And Jesus, on the other hand, has a different approach. And one of the approaches, and that approach is an approach that we're going to learn about a little bit this morning in the book of Ephesians as we continue our study. And that is, we're going to be talking about the idea of unity. What does it mean to be unified in Christ? And how do we approach that unity? What are some of the characteristics or virtues? And what are some of the things that we stand on? What are the pillars that we stand on in order for us to be unified in the name of Jesus Christ? And so this morning, as we begin, we want to remind us that we are transitioning again. Paul has already told us who we are in Christ in the first three chapters. And now we are going into the next three chapters, and Paul is going to remind us who we should be like, what our lives should look like, 
how we should treat one another and how we should bond together as God's people. We remember that we are redeemed. God has chosen and elected you. God has sent his son on the cross to die on the cross for your sins and for my sins. He has broken down the dividing wall between the Jews and the Gentiles by taking upon himself the sacrifice of the world, the sins of the world, so that you and I might know that we belong to the family of God, that we are his offspring. The prophets and the apostles, based on that foundation and the, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone of that new building, that new temple that we are in Christ. God has poured out his boundless riches upon us so that now through his riches we might not lose heart, but that we might take strong stance on who we are in Christ. We recognize that our identity is related, is based on the gospel message of Jesus Christ himself. He has expressed to us the unfathomable love that he has for us. He has given us the understanding and the knowledge to know the unreachable knowledges that he has in who he is. He has proclaimed the mystery of the gospel message so that you and I might know and live into that mystery. And now Paul, as he has been praying, last week we saw he was on his knees interceding for his people, for these people of Ephesians, and for us as well, that we might live into this reality, that we might now understand the love that he has for us, and live lives transformed by the renewing of our minds into the gospel message itself. And so this morning we continue to read in Ephesians chapter 4 as Paul continues um, in this passage. Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 1, hear the word of the Lord. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called in the Lord. One Lord, one faith, one baptism one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word, and would you pray with me? Our gracious Heavenly Father, as we look at this important passage, uh, this idea of unity and what that unity is based on, and how we are to apply that to our lives as brothers and sisters, we ask, Lord, that you would enlighten our hearts that you would give us a vision of who you are and what your church is to be about and who we are and what we are to be about as your daughters and sons. And so this morning, Lord, we seek you. We seek your wisdom. We seek your discernment. We seek the power of your Holy Spirit to transform us to be more like your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Paul reminds us again that he is a prisoner of the Lord and for the people. He's a prisoner because of the foundation that he's set in the lives of other people. He's a prisoner because of the gospel message itself. Because of the great theology that Paul has laid out for us in the first three ch chapters, he now wants us to understand how we can be enabled to go forward from that reality. You see, theology isn't just a mere mental exercise. We think of theological concepts as something that, well, that's just for the the theologians and the, and the professors and, and the guys in seminary and things like that. But theology is something that is something that you and I practice every day. You are a theologian, whether you know it or not. Because how you view the world represents the fact of how you actually view God. Is God the ruler of your world? Is God sovereign in your world? Or is God just kind of a concept of a nice, gentle loving being out there somewhere that always is trying to meet my needs. You see, for Paul, he wants us to recognize the real truth of who God is and who we are in him. We are to live our lives, he says, worthy of the gospel. I don't know about you, but I don't feel worthy. 
a lot of the time. How can I, as a sinful being, as someone who has rebelled against the holy God, live a life worthy of the gospel? Paul would remind us that it's not based on your works or your ability to live a worthy life, but it's based on the love and grace that God has poured upon you, uh, upon you, that it is his righteousness that he has imputed into our lives that we are worthy of living the calling that he's placed upon us. Notice what he says. He says this, that it's not because you obey me that I'm going to bless you and that you should live your lives, but he says, because you have been blessed, because I have poured out my riches upon you, because now you have access to everything that I have been able to give to you in this person of Jesus Christ, that because of that, you are to live your lives worthy of the gospel. We live our lives out of the blessing of God, not to receive the blessing, although when we do live out of the blessing, we are receiving the very blessing that he has for us. Uh, Pastor Ray Stedman reminds us in his preaching on this text that the world looks at the church as being irrelevant. We live in a culture that looks at the church, the organized church, as sort of irrelevant. The church doesn't meet the needs of the people, they say. The church represents something that's very divisive, and very straight in their way of thinking, and not very inclusive in the, in the world around us. And yet for that real reason, the world looks to us as the church, as the body of Christ, to be something more than we are, and that is to be unified. You see, Paul recognizes the fact that there's something very essential of who we are as Christians. Being a Christian is more than just coming to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. That's the beginning. That's what it means to be born again. That's what it means to start a new life and living for Christ. But the reality is, is that it's more to it. We are connected as one another. We are the body of Christ, and we are to live in unity. In fact, Paul says here that we are to do everything possible to maintain that unity, to keep that unity, to make every effort to keep that unity. But the question becomes then, what is the unity that he's talking about? Our world cries out for unity. We cry out for tolerance. We cry out for everybody to just get along and we go, we'll be okay, that your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth. And as long as our truths don't collide, we're going to be okay. But Paul wants, us to remind, wants to remind us that our unity is not based on a world's idea of unity. The world's view of unity is to take the, common, the lowest common denominator and make that what unifies you. Do we as Christians, therefore, if we are to be unified, throw out the fundamental ba basic biblical doctrines of what it means to be a Christian? Do we negotiate those things with the world and say, well, we can fudge on this area of our lives and we will stand firm on this area of our lives just so long that you and I can be one and we can get along? We do these things in the church for the sake of being relevant to the world around us. And yet Paul reminds us that our relevancy is not what is based upon who we are in the world, but our relevancy is to be based on who we are in Jesus Christ. Many divisions in the church take place. Many of them don't have any theological meaning at all, but just because we can't agree on the color of the carpet. But many things do take place on a theological level. In fact, in our world today, evangelical theology is becoming so diluted and polluted that in many large churches there is little resembling the life of true biblical faith. We have become so culturally enamored with performance. We have been so culturally enamored with how many people we can get into the building that we tend to lose track of what we are truly here for. And so Paul reminds us of these things. He reminds us of these things through four characteristics or virtues, and he reminds us of these things through seven 
pillars of what unity looks like. Four characters of inner attitude or inner being of our heart. We need to realize that these things are in progression. And the first one that he reminds us of is the idea of being completely humble. To live a life worthy of the calling that we have been called requires humility. Pride is the thing that kills unity. We don't have unity because you don't look at it the way I look at it, and I don't look at it the way you look at it, so therefore we cannot be united. And so what do we need? We need a common, biblical, sound, theological truth that we buy into. We need to humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord that he would lift us up. We need to humble ourselves before one another, recognizing that we are on this journey together. That it's not me against you or you against me, but we together as a body, brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ, that form one body, that we are to be united. We are to make every effort to maintain this unity. This unity is humbling to us because we recognize that there's only one gospel. We don't unify over just anything, but we unify on the very gospel itself. You remember what Paul said, if we were to unify on the lowest common denominator, Paul in the book of Galatians criticized and chastised the Galatian church because they were buying into a different gospel. And Paul reminded them, as he reminds us, that if someone is to present to you a different gospel than what Paul had proclaimed, that they were to be excluded. They were not to be in the unified body of Christ. And so when we talk about what it means to be unified, we have to understand what it is that we're unifying around. We're not, under, we're not unifying around just sentimental feelings or vague notions of, do, of, of inclusion and tolerance, but we're unifying around biblical, sound, theological truths about who God is, who Jesus Christ is, and what the gospel message is. We do this in humility and in love. In essentials, we need to be unified. In unessentials, we need to show liberty. And in all things, we need to show charity. So what are the essentials? Grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, the scriptures alone, for the glory of God alone. Those are the things that unify us as Christians, as brothers and sisters in Christ. That it is by grace that you've been saved through faith. We've talked about this when we were in chapter 2. It is that unconditional gift that God has given to each one of us that we are saved through faith and not of our works, but it is the gift of God. We come to that in a sense of humility. And humility leads to meekness and gentleness. Blessed are the meek, Jesus said, for they will inherit the earth. Now when I hear the word meek, and I, maybe the word meek means to you, is someone that's kind of just kind of reserved and just kind of mealy-eyed faith and just has a very weak uh, personality and just kind of gooey. <laughs> But the reality is, is that meekness is power and strength under control. You see, we are to be humble, and we are to be meek. We are to be humbly in the sense that as we approach people, we recognize the fact that we have the power of the living God through the gospel, but we apply that to our lives in a way that we speak the truth in love. We have been called as brothers and sisters to the highest calling that you could ever have. Paul is reminding us that we need to live into that high calling. But in that high calling, we have a low position. We don't raise ourselves up and say, look how great we are. We raise Jesus Christ up and say, look how great he is. And because he is so great, he raises us up 
And we, as the brothers and sisters in Christ, in unity, need to raise one another up. The next thing is, it's persevering. We are gentle, bearing one with one another. We persevere. I think of what persevering means. What does it mean to persevere? What does it mean to have long suffering? It means to never give up under difficult circumstances. I think of the people that, in the, in the Bible, that had a lot of perseverance and, and stayed the course even in the midst of difficulty. You think of Abraham and Sarah. You think of Noah. Think of what the people said to Noah as he's building the ark. Dude, what are you doing? Rain, what is that? You know, it didn't rain until the flood. That was the first time it rained on the earth. How about Job? You know, you always hear the, the saying, the patience of Job. Or how about Jesus having patience with his disciples? Or how about Jesus having patience with you? How about Jesus having patience with me? Or how about the prophets of the Old Testament who never got to see the fulfillment of their prophecies when Jesus came, but they held firm in their, in their faith, understanding that these things came from God. Patience takes anything that people can get, us, get at us, and we take it. We don't buckle. We don't succumb to the pressure but we rise up because of the power that God has given us. You see, with God's power that is rooted and grounded in love, I can be a patient person. How many people here, you don't have to raise your hand, but just think of yourself, struggle with patience? I'll raise my hand. But I know that in the power of God rooted in his love, I can be a patient person when I come before him humbly, when I ask for his wisdom and discernment, I can see beyond the immediate crisis or the immediate circumstance and recognize the fact that God has something going on in my life that I might not see at the present time, but that I can trust in him because he tells us that all things work together for good to those who love Christ and are called according to his purposes. And because of that truth, that is why we are to live our lives worthy of of the calling that you have been given. The calling that you have been given is to follow Christ with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. The calling that we have given empowers us to keep the bond of unity that Paul is responding, us, replying for us to have. And that bond of unity is in the Spirit of God. Because of the Spirit working within us, we can bear the fruit of that spirit, and we make every effort, Paul reminds us, to keep the bond of unity and of peace. Humility leads to gentleness. Gentleness leads to patience and long-suffering, and that is a powerful, powerful witness to the world around us. Because when the world around us sees the church living and along those lines, when it's based on the solid foundation of biblical theological truth, then the world might take notice, and our evangelism might have greater inroads into a world that is anti-God and anti-Christian at this point. You see, what a lot of happens in our lives is that we think, well, Jesus is coming soon. I mean, just look at the world events. Look what's going on in the world, all the, death, all the catastrophes and disasters that are going on. And we sometimes look at that, and I'm afraid sometimes we look at those things and we just kind of sit back. And we kind of say, well, you know, God's going to come. He's coming soon. But I think it's a reminder for us to be more assertive in our walk with the Lord. You see, God's not coming yet because those whom he has chosen and elected have not all come into the fold yet. That means that he wants to use you and me to draw people into the fold of the body of Christ. We are one. Some pillars that he wants us to understand that unifies us 
that we are to live into. I want you to notice, too, that Paul is reminding us that we don't make or create unity. Only God creates unity. What we have, he tells us, is that we are to keep and to maintain the unity that he has already given to us. And the unity is based on these seven pillars. The first one is that there is one body in Christ Jesus. Not one organization in Christ Jesus, not one business in Christ Jesus, but one body. And why do I make those distinctions? Are we not as a church organized? Yes, we are. I hope we are organized in what we do. But God doesn't look at us as an organization. He looks at us as his body. You see, it comes from our spiritual life, comes from the spiritual reality that Jesus is the one who gives us new life. When we were born again, Jesus is the first raised from the dead according to the gospel. That we, in our lives, take on the very essence of who God is by the power of the Spirit. And like an organism that as one cell produces another cell with the same DNA, so you and I, as we as Christians, grow in our faith, produce same things with the DNA of God's Spirit within us. We are a living, breathing, alive organism of Christ in the world today. Paul is saying, because that's true, because you have one body, live into it and grow into that body. Be mature. Grow up. Spend time in my word. Spend time sharing the gospel message. Spend time lifting one another up and being unified. Not only is there one body, but there is only one spirit, the spirit of Christ. This speaks to the strength. It leads us into all truth. The spirit of God convicts us of sin so that we might come in repentance. The spirit of God always points us to Jesus. It speaks of the power of the church. The church is to be filled with the spirit. The church is to access the spirit to the world around us. The spirit of God is to engage us and unify us in a way that it only comes from God. It is the power of his might, not by our works, not by our efforts, as we saw last week in Zechariah 4, 6. Not only is there one body or one spirit, but there is only one hope. And that one hope is in the risen, returning of Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you to invite someone to come to Easter service on Sunday. We're going to be talking about the hope that we have in Christ. And maybe there's someone in your realm of influence or life that you might want to bring. You see, the hope that we have in Jesus is the hope not only for a purpose in our life today, but the hope of him returning. 1 John 3, 2 says, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known, but we will know that when he appears, we will be like him, for we will see him just as he is. And therefore, everyone who has this hope purifies themselves just as he is pure. We have one hope in Jesus, the risen, returning Christ. We have one Lord. Christ is King. What unifies us is that we have one Lord. We have one hope. We have one spirit. We have one body. One Lord Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus? Philippians 2 tells us who Jesus is that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Acts chapter 4 tells us in in verse 12 that there is no other name under heaven given by among men by which we must be saved. We cannot say Caesar is Lord. We cannot say Buddha is Lord. We cannot say Krishna is Lord. We cannot say Muhammad is Lord because they are not Lord. There's only one Lord, and that's Jesus. 
We can't mix these religions together and say, well, we're just unified because we're just feeling different parts of the elephant, but we're all looking at an elephant. You see, unity comes at a price. Unity comes at the assurance of knowing what we are unified about. Jesus is Lord, meaning he was from the beginning and he exists for all of eternity. We don't have unity with other religious systems that say, well, Jesus was a created being. We don't have unity with other religious systems that says, well, you and I can exalt ourselves up and someday be like Jesus and become a god and have our own planet to rule. The only person that is the Lord is the eternal Son of God, Jesus Christ. We have one faith, and not Christ plus something, but in Christ alone. We don't put our faith in Jesus Christ and then say, well, I've got to do this, that, and the other thing to maintain my salvation. We are saved by grace, and we have works to, in order to show forth that we have already been saved. It's not Christ minus. It's not Christ saying, well, he's just a good teacher, but he's not God. He's just a good philosopher, but he's not de deity. See, our world around us says, well, Jesus is a good teacher. He's a moral good teacher. But you know what? We aren't saved on Jesus' good morality. He was perfect in everything that he did in his heart and in his works. But we are saved because of the cross. We are saved because of the sacrifice that he gave for our sins. And therefore, there is only one baptism. One baptism into Christ. Now, there are different views of whether baptism should be done through infants or whether a believer's baptism. Whatever mode people are baptized, there is only one baptism. And that baptism is in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and we are baptized into the body of Christ. So one of the reasons when we baptize somebody here at this church is that we are baptizing them into the body of believers. We don't baptize people and just say, well, you go off and do your own thing. No, we baptize people into the body of Christ. So there's one baptism, one faith, one God, one gospel message. We need two encourage one another, and build each other up. And finally, there is only one Father. God is the Father of all, but he has been revealed to us in Christ Jesus. Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 30, I and my Father are one. So when we look to Jesus, we see the essence of our Father that the Trinity, which we're going to be talking about in Sunday school, so I would like to invite you to that as well as we talk about what the Trinity is, that there is only one Father, there is only one God, there is only one mediator between God and man, and that is that man, Christ Jesus, the one who historically came into this world over 2,000 years ago, who walked and talked and taught and died and was crucified and rose again, and now will return. These are the things that we are to unify over. We are to work diligently that our unity is based on sound biblical reality of doctrine. We don't just have warm fuzzy feelings about Jesus. We have feelings about Jesus because he is good to us, but they are based on evidence and truth. They are based on the reality of who God is and how God has revealed himself to each one of us. Therefore, let us live our lives worthy of the calling in keeping the unity of the Spirit. Let us live worthy of the calling to be diligent in keeping the unity of the Spirit, which means to guard the gospel message, to guard the reality of the truth of the Scriptures, to maintain the orthodox understanding of what the biblical truth is, that we are to do this with peace and love and gentleness and patience, bearing with one another, Fo focusing on what those things are that unify us, 
and those things that we come together and, and be one in and express those things to a world so that the world would see that the God of the Bible is the God who lives today and is inviting them to have eternal relationship with him even now. So as Jesus was riding in on a donkey into Jerusalem and they were singing Hosanna, what would Jesus be like if he rode in on a donkey today? How would you and I respond? How would the world respond? Let us point people to the risen Christ, the one who is to come, the one who is to die, the one who died for our sins and given us the word of God so that we might stand true to the biblical understanding of who, who we are as Christians so that we can diligently be unified in all that we do. May God be with us as we seek his will. May God give us the power in his love that we might diligently seek the unity of the body of Christ together. In Jesus' name, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do understand these pillars are so vital and important to our unity. You have blessed us with, from all of creation, Lord. And now we need to stand on these pillars to unify us, Lord, to bring us to an understanding of who we are in you and what we are called to do. And so, Lord, would you empower us by the power of your Spirit to love one another, to diligently seek the unity that binds us together in you, and to progress and to profess that unity to a world that desperately needs the love of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. I will 
Thank you, Father, for inviting us into your presence today. Stir hope and a yearning for you into our hearts. Continually wash away our fears and give us strength and your grace sufficient for each day. You are the God who saves, takes our brokenness and makes us new. You alone are worthy of all our praises. We exalt and lift you up on high. Jesus, our King, majestic, our Redeemer and the Lord of heaven. You are our maker, you know our names, our every thought. You see us and hear us and love us. You've given us purpose, Father, ancient of days. You call us your own and we praise you. You have all authority over heaven and earth. Though the nations raise, kingdoms rise and fall, you are still the one king reigning over all. We praise you for confusing the Russian troops in Ukraine and protecting the Ukrainians defending their homes. Thank you for opening the port long enough to bring aid in. Thank you, Father God, for the inland routes you have opened so that food and medicines and iodine tablets can be dispersed. We continue to ask you to bring the Ukrainian war and the Tigray genocide to an end and for your unstoppable gospel to be proclaimed and believed. Bring the peace to these regions that only you can give. We praise you for the discipling of college students at UCSB, Santa Barbara City College, and Westmont, as well as the many schools, colleges, and the Bakersfield and neighboring cities. We thank you for the hearts you have given the leaders who are discipling and mentoring these students. We ask you to deepen their relationship with you as they study your word, attend leadership retreats, lead Bible studies, and live their faith. Father, we lift up Nui's knee surgery and ask that you would cause it to have been completely successful. Give him pain-free and full mobility. We also lift up Carl to you for complete healing from his knee surgery and from his subsequent stroke. Please give him strength and encouragement as he rehabilitates. Bless those organizing, preparing, and serving the Seder meal on Thursday. Please uh, cause the evening to give you all the glory. Loving God, help us to be completely humble and gentle, patient, bearing with one another in love, unified in your spirit. Through you, all these things are possible. You are the ancient of days, none above or before you. All time is in your hands. Yours, Father God, are all the power and the glory. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Amen. As we continue to worship the Lord by the giving of our tithes and our offerings, let us remember the joy of giving back to what he's already blessed us with. May God bless you as you give because of your faithfulness to him, recognizing the fact that those gifts go to a world that desperately needs the gospel message. And through our missionaries and through what's going on here at this church, we are very blessed to be able to be part of God's plan in bringing the gospel message to those around us and to the world. So let us give joyfully to the Lord as we give of our tithes and our offerings.
How good it is to be united in the Lord. 